Hey guys, um, well, I'm on my way to uh, Costa Rica, trying to get some things organized for next year's trip, and uh, and looking forward to the 85 degree weather that uh, we're expecting to have for the next couple of days. I know it was freezing whenever we left this morning, so, um, well, you know, I'll, I'll soak up the sun just for you guys. Uh, but today I wanted to run through really quickly the assessment of the thoracic spine. Um, We've done every joint and every set of joints up to the thoracic region. And today's lecture is going to take 30 minutes tops, um, hopefully just to, to run through really quickly all the things that we have to do when it comes to the evaluation and assessment of the thoracic. Now, so far we've covered every joint, every um, peripheral joint. We've looked at the lumbar region. We've looked at the uh, cervical region. And there's been a common thread and a common theme to everything that we've done. For every uh, joint that we've looked at, we've looked at uh, structuring our evaluation from a subjective uh, evaluation where we we hear the patient's side of, of um, the story as it is. We hear what the, the symptoms that are affecting them, the issues that they are having most with the condition that they're um, enduring. And then we try and do an objective evaluation where we assess uh, things that we can measure in the, the joint or in the region that we're uh, investigating to really try and, and put some sort of, of understanding of, of from our perspective, from the anatomical biomechanical perspective, what has gone on or what's happening in this uh, with this patient so that we can really try and get back to the normal, try and help the patient if they need increased range of motion, if they need increased strength, if they need um, some greater stability, whatever it is, we're going to try and do uh, use all of our techniques to be able to help them get back to uh, a more normal functioning lifestyle. And so the thoracic is no different. Um, what's interesting about the thoracic region is that if you, you think about the cervical evaluation and the lumbar evaluation, in the cervical evaluation, we, we don't just um, evaluate the, the vertebrae that are just C1 to 7, but we look at, at the vertebrae from C1 all the way down, including T2. And so we've already ventured into the thoracic region in our cervical evaluation. Now, in the lumbar evaluation, what we look at in the lumbar evaluation is not just the lumbar spine, but we go from sacrum all the way up into T10. So we look at T10, T11, T12. And so effectively all that's left is T3 to T9. And so when we think about a true thoracic issue, we are really thinking about the, the vertebrae between the third and the ninth thoracic vertebrae. Now if you need to, you can look at the whole thoracic spine. Just because it's a, a T2 issue doesn't mean that, oh, is that cervical? No, it, it's just that's the way that the regions are kind of broken up. But if, if you have a concern or if you want to look at how T3, T2 are, are moving relative to the rest of the thoracic or the rest of the cervical, then you should do that. But whenever we break it down and we look at our, at our regions, we're looking at the cervical being from uh, occiput down to T2. We're looking at the lumbar being from the sacrum up to T10. And then everything else in between is what we really consider when we do the thoracic evaluation. Now on the, the thorax, we've talked last week about the, the bony anatomy and the structures of the, the spines themselves and the vertebral bodies, the long spinous processes, and then the attachments of the ribs as the ribs come in. What we didn't really talk about last week um, so much in lecture was the position of the scapula and the location of the scapula and how the scapula then interacts with the thoracic region and the rib cage. Erica started to talk a little bit about it on, on Monday. We did a little bit of our evaluation of the scapula. Um, Seth's going to go into the scapula a whole lot more this coming Monday when we really start to look at our PNF uh, and how the, the scapula moves and, and how this bone, which is kind of captured inside a, a number of muscles through the proper positioning, can help affect good motion or in a poor position will actually cause there to be a, a loss of range or a decrease of function. And so we've got to think about the scapula in terms of, of the thoracic region. Now, with, when it comes to having a painful scapula, if there's pain in the scapula, then a lot of times that comes actually from the cervical. 
And so typically whenever we have these thoracic issues and there's scapular pain, we've got to clear the cervical uh, joints. And that shouldn't come as a surprise to you because for every joint so far, we've cleared the joints above and the joints below. And so to, to clear the, the cervical region is, is nothing new. And on Friday coming more one, we'll talk with you about how to clear the, uh, the cervical region um, as part of our evaluation. It doesn't mean that you do a full-on neck eval. It also doesn't mean you do a full-on lumbar eval um, when you're dealing with thoracic. But there's just a few clearing movements just to be able to check that the problem that we're dealing with is not coming from either above or from below. In the same way that the scapular pain can be coming from the neck, sacroiliac pain and iliac crest pain can be coming from the thoracic region. And so when we get those lower down issues, those that that lower thoracic region, we've got to um, look at, at the potential referral from the lower T-spine down into the sacrum or down into the iliac crest so we can rule out those problems as well. And as I said before, if you're in doubt, check the whole thing. Look at the whole spine, um, the whole way up. Don't just be, be stuck on T3, T9, but go all the way from T1 to T12. Now, every patient and every joint that we have considered so far has always begun with our subject of examination. And so our subject of examination in the thoracic spine is no different. We're going to start by evaluating pain. The location of pain, the nature of the pain, the intensity of the pain, what exacerbates the pain, what actually makes the pain, uh, what what eases the pain a little bit, and we're going to look at all of those things. It's no different than what we would do in the neck, or no different than what we would do in the low back. We're also going to evaluate stiffness, and you'll find in the thoracic region that stiffness comes in a lot more than it does in the lumbar region. And so we're not just going to see the, the pain, which does exist, but also the available range of motion. And again, Friday, we're going to actually put all this into practice. Along with pain and stiffness, we always look at, at uh, paresthesia or numbness and then tingling. And so we make sure that, that we look at the referral. So what is happening in the spine and how is that being referred then around the chest wall into the scapular region or into the iliac crest region? And we want to identify what's going on there. Now, a real uh, important note is that we're going to identify if there's any upper limb problems. If there's any issues in the arm, if there's any funny sensations that are going on in the arm, if there's any numbness or tingling that's going right down into the hands, then we've got to think back to the thoracic because we can end up with referral patterns that come from the thoracic region all the way down into the hand and into the arm. And so we can't just get isolated and stuck down at the hand. We've got to think about uh, about where does this possibly come from. And we've done so much with our upward intention test and all those sorts of things. We're going to look then at, at one of the, the last sort of conditions. And again, Marwan's going to talk about the conditions on Friday, but things like thoracic outlet syndrome, where it's a thoracic uh, issue causing compression of either nerves or the vascular system, which causes distal symptoms in the hand. And so again, we've got to think globally even though we're breaking this down region by region. As always, we're going to look at the history of the condition, and not just the the, um, the past history and, and uh, the long litany of things that have happened, but we're going to look at the present history. What happened for this current exacerbation? What were the, the things that led up to the problem beginning? What are the things that are then um, exacerbating or helping the problem? So just like we've done for the neck, just like we've done for the lower back, we're going to look at the, at the history of the, of the condition. Now we're going to take all that information, and this shouldn't be news to you, but we're going to take all the information from our subject evaluation, and we're going to use that to then help direct what we're going to do when it comes to our objective evaluation. And so we listen to their story. We look at the location of the, the pain. We look at the level and degree of the stiffness. We look at the dysfunction that's being caused by those things, and we begin to, to tie those into anatomical structures that we can then assess in our objective evaluation to give us a pinpoint um, location where we can then apply our treatment techniques, where we can focus our modalities if we're going to use them, or we can really gear our, our, um, our rehab protocols. And so we take our subjective, we then direct our objective, and we come up with our goals and our action plan. Now, when it comes to the, the pain, we've got to identify not just that there is pain, but where is that pain? When is that pain present? Is it there while sitting? 
Is it there while standing? Is it there while walking? Because a lot of thoracic issues are postural issues. And so we need to identify that the patient has pain whenever they walk. But when you walk and you stand up into a walking position, you go up into a more extended position. Well, extension in the thoracic spine is going to cause compression of the spinous processes, one on top of the other, potentially. And so if that's a position that they find problematic, then is there a problem that is occurring between spinous processes? If you get uh, a lot of times with the with thoracic issues, you'll have um, particularly in adolescence and growth spurts and people that grow uh, a, a large amount in one year. Well, you get somebody that grows a number of inches in one year and none of their friends grow, then they end up being the tallest person and they end up then stooping over. So you get these really tall kids that have little friends and they end up, you know, standing in this hunched position because they don't want to stand out. They don't want to be the big kid they don't want to be the tallest person there and so they end up then putting themselves into an inappropriate posture which then affects the thoracic spine which affects and brings on problems later on in life and so we want to address the posture as they sit as they stand and as they walk that also then can affect then their working life how they sit whenever they work in, in an office chair how they sit uh, or how they they um, how they interact when they're in college or in school um, you've got to identify all of those types of things. So think about their, their everyday posture, think about their work posture, think about what they do um, during the day and how that then affects their back. One thing that can occur in the, in the thoracic region is that with an ex excess amount of rotation it can uh, exacerbate symptoms because of the compressive forces that are going on to the uh, facet joints um, side by side or the compressive forces that are going on to the sternoclavicular, sternoclavicular, <laughs> into the costosternal uh, joints, um, or the costovertebral joints. And so you get all those little tiny joints that we talked about last week, and you get the compression and the impact that's happening on those, um, then with motion, we've got to be aware of that. When it comes to the uh, thoracic region, we've got to be aware of the rib cage. We've got to be aware that motions of the rib cage are going to be potentially problematic. And so we have to ask our patients about breathing. We have to ask them about do they have an increase in pain whenever they take a deep breath. Um, so if they take a full inspiration, then the motion of the ribs, the movement of the ribs can then cause problems at the, uh, the little joints of the, between the ribs and the vertebrae. And that can then give us an indication as to the location of the problems and then also what may make things worse. We also want to ask a patient about coughing and sneezing. Now when you ask a patient does it hurt when they cough or sneeze, a lot of times they, they don't really they don't really know um, unless it's very painful. And so a quick way to check it is to ask them to cough. Take a deep breath in, hold it for momentarily and then let it all out really quickly. So get them to cough and see what goes on. Watch their facial expressions, watch how they cough, watch whether they can expel all the air, uh, and just identify if coughing is really a problem issue for them. Now, in the lumbar region, coughing is more of an indication of a discogenic problem, and that's because of the, the changes in pressure that we're seeing whenever we cough. In the thoracic region, it might not be a discogenic issue, but it may be more of a rib problem, a more of a, a vertebral joint issue. And so we just want to be aware of that as we ask our patients to do this. The other activity which can increase pain in the thoracic region is to get the patients to uh, elevate their arms. If they lift their arms above their head, they go into full um, thoracic extension. If they have a job which requires them to lift loads above their head, if they have to sh stack shelves or lift things up and down off of a height, then they're not only putting their back into full extension, they're then adding a load which is further compressing the spinous uh, processes together and further exacerbating their condition. And so those are the, the things that we really want to make sure with our thoracic patients is uh, make sure that their breathing is okay, check their inspiration, coughing and sneezing, and then ask them about do they have to do overhead work. Again, it's one of those postural things that we're going to be concerned about. There may also be a limitation of shoulder motion. I know this is not why I don't have shoulder movement. 
Um, but there may be a limitation of shoulder movement with a limitation of range of thoracic. Uh, and so, again, everything is connected. We've got to make sure that we're, we're asking the right questions to get all of the answers that we need. When it comes to the thoracic region, there's a number of red flags that we want to be aware of. Patients that present with uh, thoracic pain with bilateral leg symptoms. We want to be a, uh, sort of put a big red star against that in our evaluation because there's some level of spinal cord involvement to give bilateral symptoms uh, in the legs. And so that's a red flag. We want to be careful with those patients. We want to check those patients out um, very carefully to see exactly what's going on. There may be an instability issue. Um, in their thoracic region, which is then causing these symptoms. And so we want to be really careful how we treat those people. If patients have unilateral leg and arm symptoms at the same time, so that means right arm, right leg are painful at the same time, or left arm, left leg, then again, there's something considerable going on to have uh, symptoms going into both extremities at one time. We're going to be very careful uh, in terms of checking those out. Those patients that report an increase in clumsiness or stumbling or weak feelings, we want to just really be, be mindful of, of our evaluation, not rush through it, but just take our time. Again, this is the subjective directing the objective. As we hear these types of things being mentioned, we're making mental notes. We're not giving it away on our faces. We're not going, oh, panic, panic, there was something seriously wrong. We're just making a mental note and realizing that we have to be a little bit more thorough in our evaluation to try and pick up what's going on with these things. Now the stumbling and the clumsiness, um, we're going to be looking at, at um, things like Babinski sign, which may not be a common thing in the thoracic, but whenever you hear these indications, then you might be thinking some sort of upper motor neuron uh, problem. And so we're going to be mindful of, of how to assess those uh, types of symptoms. When you get any of these three red flags, you have to do neurological tests. And you have to do a full neuro exam on whichever extremity. If it's bilateral arm and leg, then you do an upper uh, extremity neuro test and a lower extremity neuro test. If it's just in the upper limbs, you do upper limbs. If it's just in the lower limbs, you do lower limbs. But you do the neuro examination for the lumbar or the cervical, depending upon which one it is, or if it's both. And then, of course, we ask all of our usual mandatory questions. And in the thoracic spine, some of our mandatory questions become a little bit more important in terms of, particularly in terms of recent weight loss and weight gain. Now, you know that we ask that question because we're of our concern um, of patients that have had unexplained weight loss or unexplained weight gain um, can be indicative of some sort of tumor or um, or cancer growth. And so it's an easy way to see if there's been some further problems that we can then probe deeper with our questions. Uh, to, to potentially identify if there has been some sort of cancer in their recent past. The reason why it's, that's most important in the thoracic spine is that the thoracic region becomes a prime location for secondary metastases to come from other tumors and other parts of the body. So a lot of times people who have had cancer, who have had some sort of uh, history of cancer or battle with cancer, um, the doctors will, will often do uh, chest x-rays and they're not so much looking at the lungs, but a lot of times they're looking at the thoracic region to see if there's any bone cancer has uh, been thrown off into the thoracic vertebrae. So you, again, you want to be very mindful of that. Now when it comes to the objective exam, then just like our other uh, joints and regions, the things that we look at are the obvious things first, and then we get down into the nitty gritty. And so the first thing you're going to do is have your posture evaluation. I know you love posture evaluation, but this is what we do. Thoracic region, all important. We're looking at the shape of the curves. We're looking at the kyphosis. We're looking at the scoliosis, um, whether it's present or not. Um, and we're trying to identify if that kyphosis is a, a normal range, an abnormal range. We're going to talk about that in a little uh, moment or two and also identify whether there's a scoliosis and if that scoliosis is pathological and if it's potentially problematic. We're going to look in and ask about and uh, assess any associated neck issues, so any cervical problems, any complaints of neck problems. We're going to look at how that then plays into the motion and the available range uh, of the thoracic. We're going to look and palpate for stiffness. And then we're going to look at the at the junctions, the thoracolumbar junction and the th uh, cervicothoracic junction. 
So we're going to look at the connecting points between the regions just to see that um, that they're normal, that the range that should be there is there. Um, remember that the upper cervical C1, C2, or T1, T2 are the least mobile um, joints in the entire uh, vertebral chain. And so we don't expect to be a lot of motion there. But there should be some, some movement. We're also going to check the relative flexibility. We're going to check the uh, the range of motion, but then also how functional their flexibility is. So that they, uh, as they breathe, as they move, um, as they just go about activities of daily living, that they have the functional ability to be able to get into the positions so that they're not overstraining or overstretching other regions and other joints. Now, I mentioned kyphosis. And we kind of, I've heard about kyphosis, uh, before and just the, the shape of the, uh, of the thoracic spine and the curvature, the posterior curvature of the thoracic spine. But there's actually a number of different types of kyphosis. And you need to be aware of, of what we call the dummy signs, which might look like kyphosis, but it's not really a kyphotic spine. And those dummy signs are, are typically the positioning of the scapula. When you look at the scapula, if the scapula is sitting very flat, on the, the chest wall, it can make the whole chest wall look like it's sitting very flat. But you need to look through the scapula and beyond the scapula to see the curvature of the thoracic region, not just the visual illusion that the, th that the scapula throw off. Similarly, if the scapula are, are winged, okay, if they're elevated out, it can actually make it look like there's an increase in the kyphosis or an increase in the kyphotic nature of the thoracic. And it's not really the thoracic that is, has got this increase in kyphosis, but it's the position of the scapula, the way that they, they are elevated away from the rib cage, that makes it appear like there is a kyphosis. So look out for those two little tricks, flat scapula and winging scapula. Look beyond them and look at the spine itself. So what are we dealing with when we talk about a kyphotic spine? Um, well, over on, on this side, okay, normal, typical normal spine, ear over shoulder over uh, greater trochanter. In this position, the ear is nowhere near the shoulder. And it's not because of forward head, or not simply because of forward head, but because of the curvature that occurs in the thoracic region. Now, often there's an increase in kyphosis in the thoracic, and then an increase in lordosis in the uh, lumbar to try and position the head and the neck so with an increase in lordosis in the neck, the patient can still look forward. What you will see is a decrease in the height. And so if, if your patients, if you uh, ask your patients what height they are and then measure what height they are, quite often you will see a, a change um, as over time what they believe they are, they, they gradually start to get shorter and shorter. And when we take x-rays of the uh, thoracic region, we start to see some anterior wedging, as we call it. And there's actually a big old fracture right up in there. And so you end up with this curvature, okay, this kyphotic spine shape because of some sort of anterior breakdown or wedging in the uh, vertebral bodies of the thoracic region. So a couple of different types of kyphosis that you'll hear around back. Um, most common in adolescents and young adults, and those are the, the sort of kids that stand all hunched over. Typically, the, the kids that hit the growth spurt early, and they're the tall kids, and they're the awkward kids, and they don't want to be the awkward tall kid. And so all their friends are small, so they stand hunched over, and they end up with this rounded back. And that, essentially, all they're doing is just slouching whenever they stand or they sit. That then, over a period of time, will cause the spine to curve forward, um, and you end up with a postural kyphosis. They can also then demonstrate this increase in lumbar uh, lordosis as they try and, and sort of keep upright, but they don't want to be as tall as they really are. Now, if these patients lie down uh, on a bed or on, the, on the, the tables, then that that kyphosis typically will just disappear and they'll flatten into it. And so it's a reversible. It's a posture that they have adopted that we need to train them out of, um, but it is reversible at this stage. When you look at x-rays with round backs, there's no real noticeable uh, abnormalities. Um, there's no structural damage that's taken place, okay? Um, because in some some people just, these postural kyphoses, they, they don't call it a true kyphosis because it's not, it's not held in that position. Um, if we can just 
gain the patient's confidence if it's an adolescent and help them understand that, that they do need you know, yes they're taller than everybody else but they need to stand up they need to be uh to to walk at their full height that the more that they stay in this rounded position the more pain and problems they're going to get um and, and we can typically uh educate people out of it worst case scenario they might need to go to some sort of brace or cast but in my experience, that has not really been necessary for these round backs or these postural kyphoses. Uh, a lot of times the patients just, there's the, the psychosocial aspect of it. And once they get through that and they understand that, um, and once their friends start to grow, then they, a lot of this can just disappear. Now, a slightly different um, kyphotic position, moving from a round back into a humpback, or uh, as it's called, a gibbous. A uh, gibbous is a, a very sharp, angled, um, or posterior angulation uh, of the thoracic spine. You can see up in the picture up here where you've got this normal spine on this side and then you get this angulation, very sharp bend. Okay, so it's not the whole spine, it's only a small portion of it which ends up very uh, angled. And it's it's typically with these humpback and these, these gibbous formations, they're typically higher up in the upper thoracic region. You end up with a structural deformity because of anterior wedging of the vertebral bodies of at least one and typically two uh, vertebral bodies. So there's there's some sort of compression that takes place in those vertebral bodies and that then becomes a structural issue. This is not a postural deformity. This doesn't just go away by standing up straight. There has been structural damage done. Um, there may be wedge fractures in those uh, vertebral bodies. There may be uh, some sort of bone disease or tumor growth that has occurred, which causes these. And you end up, uh, whenever we see our patients, with this visible hump on the posterior aspect uh, of the upper thoracic region. The opposite of humpback is flat back. And with a flat back, um, you end up with a decreased pelvic inclination of about 20 degrees, and they end up with quite a mobile spine. So it's kind of similar to round back, except the thoracic spine tends to stay mobile and doesn't tend to, to get locked up. And they can uh, they can compensate for it uh, for their changes in center of gravity and through through positioning um, just by being able to move their thoracic spine. When you look at these at these patients, they don't look like they have an excessive uh, sort of kyphotic spine, but you can begin to see where they begin to flatten flatten out. Um, the lordosis flatten out the kyphosis and they have what we call flat back. You get some people in on Friday in, in lab, we'll start looking around and see if we can identify some of these things. I don't think we're going to have a gibbous and I don't think we're going to have a dowager's hump, uh, but we might have some round backs and we might have some flat backs. We'll, we'll definitely look. The dowager's hump is um, kind of similar to the gibbous but not as pronounced. Uh, as the gibbous can be. Typically results from uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis, uh, causes anterior wedge fractures of one, two, or more uh, vertebral bodies, and you end up with a greater rounding, not just a sharp angulation, but a greater rounding of the uh, the entire thoracic spine, or more of the thoracic spine than in a gibbous situation. And you end up then potentially with a scoliosis. Um, the patients tend to get a little bit smaller, and so they start off at this height, and then as they start to get those anterior wedge fractures, they end up down at this height. And what happens is that the vertebral bodies that start in this nice sort of block form end up being wedged and wedge-shaped. And if you add a number of these wedges on top of each other, you end up with this increase in, in curvature and this increase in kyphosis. So what do we want to uh, tell our patients? Well, the first thing we want to give them is we want to give them good postural uh, advice. We want to talk to them about their, their posture. And that's why constantly, whenever you're in the lab, whatever we're working on you in the lab, and we bring you up for a demonstration and you sit on the lab, we, we get you to sit up straight. It just becomes a natural thing that as PTs we want to do. Is we want to get our patients to get into that habit of having a good postural position as you all slouch in your chairs and gradually begin to feel bad and correct your posture. We also want to give them a bunch of home exercises. We want to get them to think about this, not just at their workstations, and but to think about their, their posture, to think about their back position at all times during the day. And so we may need, if we've got these rounded posture patients, we might need to think and work on seeing some thoracic extension work. We might need to start to think about doing even anterior pelvic tilts, which will then throw the rest of the spine up into an extended position to do uh, 
arm above head activities, which will again force the thoracic spine up into that uh, extended position. And we want to look at, at mobilizing soft tissues and also then mobilizing any of the bony tissues and the joints in the spine to ensure that we've got the range of motion that we can then get our patients back into good postures so that they can uh, really enjoy uh, everything that their back has to offer. So our objective exam, we've done our posture, we've looked at, at the shape of them, we've identified flat back, round back, gibbous, whatever kyphotic, whatever scoliotic uh, deformities there are. And then everything else is just the same as we've done for the cervical and for the, the lumbar region. We do our range of motion tests, okay, and again, Active range of motion, the motion of the thoracic is not very big. Okay, we tend to be, okay, that's flexion, that's extension, that's all there is to it. There's side flexion, okay, and rotation. There's not a lot of motion. You start to feel that R1, R2 coming in. Um, and so we're going to look at, at active range of motion of the thoracic. We're going to look at active range of motion of the shoulders. We're going to clear the joints above and below, which is the lumbar and the cervical regions. We're going to look at breathing. We're going to look at, at inspiration, coughing, and sneezing. Does that cause any uh, exacerbation of the symptoms? We're going to also look at muscle strength. We're going to look at muscle strength of the back. We're going to look at muscle strength of the uh, respiratory system. And then depending upon whether it's upper or lower thoracic, we're going to look at muscle strength of the uh, upper limb or muscle strength of the lower limb. So again, region-specific, begin to uh, work our way through that. And again, on Friday, Marwan's going to run through all of this. It's really quick, really straightforward. After we've done all of our active tests, after we've done our, our power tests, we don't do dermatomes, myotomes, that sort of stuff. But what we're going to do is get our patients done. We're going to do our sweep of twos. Just like we've done in the neck, just like we've done in the back, we're going to do our sweep of twos. Now, when it comes to active movements, okay, forward flexion is roughly between 20 to 45 degrees. Huge range. But depending upon who you read, those are the numbers that you get. Extension, measured at 25 to 45 degrees. Side flexion to the left and the right between 20 and 40 degrees. And then rotation to the left and right between 35 to 50 degrees. So that's why, because the, these numbers, the, particularly the rotation numbers, come up slightly higher, then that's why a number of the authors will say that the greatest motion that's available in the thoracic is rotation. But sometimes whenever you do it yourself, you might not feel it that way. It might feel more like there's flexion extension more than rotation. But technically, the numbers do work out a little better for rotation than for the other motions. Cost of vertebral expansion, we talked about this last week, is between 3 centimeters and 7.5 and centimeters. So as you take a deep breath in, the rib cage will expand out and give you that increase in volume. Um, the rib motion we talked about in terms of the pump handle and the bucket handle and the caliper action that occurs at the three different regions of the ribs, from the ribs 1 to 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 11 and 12 and how they interact because of their attachment anteriorly, or in 11 and 12 case, their lack of attachment anteriorly. Um, if necessary, we'll do combined movements. So we'll do our extension and side flexion. Okay, Extension, side flexion, and rotation. We'll try and load up the joints and see what's going on. And to bring in some of our McKenzie approach, we'll throw in some rep uh, repetition and we'll repeat the exercise, we'll repeat the movements and see if it's the repetition of the motion that really brings on or exacerbates the symptoms. If we really can't get it then we might take them into a sustained posture, hold them in that posture for a period of time until we start to get the symptoms arising. Now once you have a patient with thoracic problems and they have that th those symptoms that have, have begun to that ache that's in there, that oh, that's, that's their pain, that's their comparable sign. What you may want to do is then go back and retest some of the straight planar motions now that you've made them sore to see if the planar motions, which one of those really exacerbated. Because sometimes trying to get them sore, trying to trigger it in the first place is the difficult part. Uh, but once we get the, the pain there, then we can really begin to attack it. When it comes to our normal end fields, okay, our forward flexion is really a tissue stretch. Our extension is really a tissue stretch. Maybe a possibly a bony block with the impact of the spinous processes on top of each other. Side flexion to the left and the right and rotation to the left and the right is all stretching of the soft tissues. And so those are the feels that we get. When we do our eval of the upper limbs, we're going to check the range of motion of the shoulders, check the range of motion of the scapula, check the upper limb muscle power. So do a quick myotome screen uh, right down there. Do a quick dermatome uh, screen of the upper limb. 
particularly in the region that we think is is problematic. You might want to jump down to the five, six, seven, eight, um, as opposed to doing three, four. Okay, you might even just go six, seven, eight, T one. But you don't want to to ignore it because oh, that's part of the neck. We're going to do all of those things. So when it comes to the thoracic region, um, it's a really quick evaluation. There typically you don't see an awful lot of thoracic patients uh, that come through the doors, but when you see them. There's usually a, a defined onset and usually a, a fairly quick uh, treatment protocol that will then get them back to health and back to their normal activities pretty quickly. So they're a joy to treat, uh, but they unfortunately don't happen that often. Most of your time spent with your chronic necks and your chronic backs. Um, but you get a thoracic patient, fight for them in the clinic, hold on to them and uh, treat them. You get great satisfaction out of it. So. If you have any questions on today, um, take them to Marwan on Friday. He's going to come in and talk about the conditions that we commonly see in the thoracic region. Talk about thoracic outlet syndrome, Sherman's disease, that sort of stuff. He's going to do that on Friday morning. And then Friday afternoon, he's going to take you through our normal evaluation process um, with, the, uh, with the thoracic region. And that will be us completed. All right. I will see you guys on Monday morning. I've got all the videos posted um, up to date before I left, and uh, I even uploaded the link for you guys for all the PNF videos. I filmed all the PNF stuff last year with Seth, and so that's all up there. And uh, so I get a break. I don't need to film all of the PNF sessions for you guys this week. But Monday morning, 9:30, Seth's going to come in and give his lecture, and then Monday afternoon, going to get um, stuck into the lab activities. And so I think you're in for a real treat. All right, I'm off to enjoy the sunny weather. You guys stay warm in the cold, and I will see you on Monday.